Hey, it's Chuck. Today, news from spring practice in a walk down memory lane in part one of my interview with Kirk Barton. The 2005 Fiesta Bowl, the game of the century, and his first offer from Urban Meyer at Bowling Green. Let's get it. And I don't think he's going to throw the ball as much as he thinks he's going to throw the ball. Now that Chip Kelly's on board. And I'm happy about that. More quarterback. Um, the truth is Ryan Day has made a change philosophically. But it's none of those. You all know who wins. LSU is the drunkest fan base in the country. Start. <laughs> so the Buckeyes were back from uh, spring break yesterday, and they had their first practice with full pads. It was practice number three of fifteen in the spring break window, or in the spring practice window, and they practiced for about an hour and a half. The media was not allowed in to film anything, so we saw no footage from this practice. Uh, the media will be allowed back in. And at the end of next week, at the student appreciation practice, and that will be practice number eight. So we saw the first two. They won't get any footage till practice number eight. But Coach Day did hold a press conference yesterday, and one of the items discussed was the helmet communication devices. Uh, the Bucks are practicing right now with those devices, and that rule has not yet been approved, but it's going to be going to the head of the Rules Oversight Committee next month and is very likely to be approved. And the other rule that is very rule change that is very likely to be approved is the two minute warning at halftime and in the fourth quarter, just like in the NFL. Now, the rules committee em emphasized in their statement that this is not going to be an additional clock stoppage. It's going to be a clock stoppage that otherwise would have happened as a TV timeout somewhere in the second and fourth quarters. So it's not an additional stoppage, but it's still going to be used as a good little piece of clock management and strategy for the coaches. And having a veteran coaching staff is going to be a plus because we see NFL coaches mess up timeouts and how to handle the two-minute warning all the time. So I feel pretty comfortable with Ryan Day and Chip Kelly in their uh, management of this and that the Bucks can get an additional advantage, advantage from this uh, two-minute warning, which we're not supposed to call a two-minute warning. It's the two-minute timeout. They've made that clear. Do not call it the two-minute warning. So it's not a warning, just a two-minute timeout. Um, as for Coach Day, he said that they only have three – uh, of these communication devices in the helmets. And they started with the quarterbacks. They're going to switch it over and allow the linebackers to get acclimated to them next practice. And they're going to go back and forth like that. Now, the fact that they only had three of these has been characterized as if they were only allowed to have three of them. But we discussed last month when we talked about the company that manufactures these, um, the CEO came out, by the way, that CEO said he owes Jim Harbaugh a Christmas card, which is pretty funny that he has a shortage of these devices. He can't manufacture them fast enough. He's been supplying the NFL for 10 years or so with these devices. So he had 32 teams that he had to supply. And now all of a sudden he just added 134 new accounts in college football. So he is, you know, having a tough time pumping these things out. And I'm going to go ahead and assume that that's why the Buckeyes only have three and not that this is some uh, way that, their NCAA is making it harder on the teams. I think this is just a matter of supply. Uh, I could be wrong. I've not heard specifically, but it's just a guess I'm going to make, and I think I'm probably right. And I think it is pretty amazing that this day and age, this guy has been able to keep this contract with the NFL, <laughs> like just this one company with no competition, because apparently he's the only one that manufactures these things. And uh, hey, good for him. He's a former Nebraska lineman. And he can't stay in Michigan. That was very clear from the interview I saw that this guy gave. Uh, so yesterday at the press conference, our buddy Dylan Davis, who's going to join us on Friday this week, uh, beat reporter from the Delaware Gazette, I talked to him yesterday about uh, the Tony Alford situation and this press conference coming up with Ryan Day. This was ahead of time. And he said that he really wanted to know uh, when Ryan Day knew about the Tony Alford decision. Did he know ahead of time? Did it get sprung on him just like it got sprung on everybody else? So he led off the press conference asking that question right there, and he even asked a follow-up. Uh, Ryan spun the question. He didn't want to answer the question. And, you know, Ryan's good at spinning a question, but, you know, I wouldn't want to answer this either. He probably wants this to be out of the news cycle as fast as possible, and answering it would just get, add fuel to the fire. So no issues with that. But uh, the guy can uh, really talk in circles very well, and he does it with such a smile on his face, and he's so nice that everybody just kind of nods along, <laughs> and he doesn't say anything at all. Um, but uh, 
Would have been really satisfying if he lit Tony Alford up. I would have really liked that. Anyway, uh, later on in the press conference, he was asked, does it feel like a bit of a betrayal from Tony Alford? And he didn't want to answer that one either. And again, I don't blame him with that. Now, with the running back coach hired, he said he's going to go about it in a similar way he did with the offensive coordinator coaching hire. And that is he made three tiers. So he had three guys in tier A, three guys in tier B, and three guys in tier C. And he was asked, why did he choose Bill O'Brien over Chip Kelly, being that Chip is his mentor, his friend, they've known each other all their lives. And he said that Bill O'Brien and Chip Kelly were both in his tier A, and it was just a matter of timing why he chose Bill O'Brien first. So things obviously worked out great for him in that situation, being able to have Chip Kelly not get that job as the Seattle OC. And he got to hire another guy in tier A. He said if he got down to tier C, he was going to retain play calling himself. He wasn't going to hire candidate number six, seven, and eight. So he said he's going to structure the running back hire in a similar way. And uh, that's probably good. But the problem is it just appears that uh, DeMarco Murray has just declined the job, even though it looked very much like he was going to take it. So you've missed out on Gillespie, and you've missed out on DeMarco Murray. Um, so if he doesn't get the second guy, now he's already on to Tier B, and we're just not even a week into this yet. And that's not great. And it really looked like DeMarco Murray was going to take the job. And, uh, you know, I think the problem here is timing. If it was during the coaching cycle when they're all moving around and taking jobs and they didn't have to essentially screw over the place they're at now, take a ding on their reputation, um, make a bunch of people angry, I think you might have been able to get DeMarco Murray and maybe even Gillespie. Um, Gillespie's... Uh, now, this was reported yesterday that Gillespie got a raise from Alabama yesterday, and as if it was um, to counter Ohio State's offer. And that's not what happened. What happened yesterday was the moves that Kalen DeBoer made when he first came in, one of the best ones he did was he promoted Gillespie and defensive line coach Freddie Roach, and he gave them both big raises. And, he re and the entire staff all got raises, and everything that they got paid just got approved yesterday from the board. So that leaked out that that approved got approved. And it looked as if to some people that Gillespie just got a big raise, but that was the raise that the board gave him when he first got there. This wasn't an additional raise to counter Ohio state trying to steal him. Anyway, Gillespie's happy where he's at. He's not leaving. And now it appears to Marco Murray is not leaving either. So, um, bad news. And again, this is another one of the reasons that that what Tony Alford did was, you know, just not not good. You, you put Ohio State in a situation where they're trying to hire somebody and you're trying to make somebody do to their school what Alford just did to Ohio State. And that's the reason that uh, looks like DeMarco Murray's not coming to me. Obviously, he got a, he got a big pay raise, I'm sure, and uh, maybe mended the fences with uh, Brett Venables at Oklahoma because it seems like they're not getting along great if he's out there interviewing at Michigan and now interviewing at Ohio State. So we'll see what happens. Uh, we're almost pushing to Tier B. We might be there already. Uh, but he did say that he was going to have the running backs involved in the decision. Um, I think that was interesting. I, I mean, I think he's just trying to make them feel, you know, better about losing Tony Alford. And we're going to make you guys comfortable. You're going to meet the guy ahead of time. But uh, I don't think they'll be involved in any of that decision. And I think he's going to make them love the guy that he loves and wants for the job um, with a little persuasion, even if I'm sure they will anyway. But uh, another interesting question that was asked was, uh, does he look at the coaching staff ever at times and think it's getting stale? Uh, is there a point where he thinks maybe there might be, he might need to shake it up just to get some new blood in because it might be stale. And that was interesting because I thought that Tony Alford's tenure there was kind of coming to an end at the end of this season, and it was kind of stale. I felt like Tony had just kind of had enough. It had just run its course. The relationship with him and Day seemed to have run its course. And, you know, that happens in organizations. It happens in all organizations. So it was an interesting question. Um, Ryan said it was an interesting question, and then he answered uh, with a very long answer that didn't address the question at all. Um, so that was it for any of those things there. Let's go to the offensive line. Um, Ryan made it clear in a couple of uh, statements that Josh Fryer 
at right tackle is really uh, he, he's had a great off season. He's starting off with a great spring. And it seems to me like he really wants Fryer to win that right tackle job. He said Tegra Shibola is going to be the other guy fighting for that right tackle spot. And it seems like Luke Montgomery is, is the front runner for the right guard. And uh, Ryan thinks he has a championship level caliber uh, skill pl or players at, uh, at all the offensive uh, line positions. And I think that this is the uh, crew that he wants to go with. So no change on the left side. You got Donovan Jackson and, and Simmons. And then at center, he wants Seth McLaughlin, right guard Luke Montgomery, and he wants Fryer to stay at right tackle. I think that's what we're looking at. I think that's what's going to, I think that's probably what we're going to end up with uh, on the offensive line. And I think that's great. You know, Josh Fryer was, was all Big Ten last year and I, he got a lot of heat. I don't think he was, I don't think he was bad. I think he was pretty damn good. And I'm really excited for Luke Montgomery. The left side, Donovan didn't play quite up to snuff, but, you know, it happens. All these guys got a year bigger, a year older, and uh, a year smarter. So I think they're going to be just fine. And it's obviously the biggest area of concern. And Coach Day seems to feel really good about it. And if he feels good about it, that gives me comfort when I think about it too. So I think with tight end, we're going to end up with Will Kazmarek and G. Scott getting all the run there um, with Jelani coming in a little bit. I don't think uh, Jelani's quite ready from what we're hearing. And while Will Kazmarek is not ready yet, I think he's just, just a matter of time for him. He's definitely physically ready. The guy can block, the guy can run, the guy can catch. I think he's going to be a really good player. And G, I'm always rooting for G. G's a great Buckeye. Everybody loves him. And, uh, you know, he's never going to be a great blocker. Um, and he's just not going to be – he's just not big enough. So really rooting for him, but I think that Will Kazmarek is the guy that's going to play the majority of, uh, of tight end in 11 personnel, and uh, in 12 personnel, it's going to be him and G mostly. Uh, on to wide receiver, he said, Colonel Tate looked really good. Sky's the limit for him. And he repeatedly praised Brandon Ennis, what a competitor he is, uh, how much physically better he looks this season. And he did remind us that it is his first spring. But he's very impressed by him, and he's really looking forward to watching him play. And so am I. So we're going to be looking at Ameka and Carnell, and then Brandon Ennis and Jeremiah Smith getting most of the run at wide receiver. And that is a heck of a group. A little, you know, inexperienced, but... I have no doubt that that's going to be a great group. He said that Bryson Rogers is going to need to step it up. And he said, we need Jaden Ballard to step it up in a big way. He's got to be a contributor. And I just don't see that happening at this point. He's a senior now. Kid was almost a five-star. Kid out of Maslin, which is really, I mean, it was really exciting because we don't really produce many big-time receivers anymore ever. Uh, so I was really excited for him. And it seems like we hear every spring – some buzz about him that he's going to break out this season. And we just never see him unless he's making, I don't know, a mistake on special teams or something. And it's a bummer. It's a bummer. I don't know what his deal is. I don't want to disparage him and say things like he, he just doesn't get it. But I just don't think he gets it. Um, I, I don't think he loves football or something. There's something there. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. He's got all the talent. Uh, he is the leader of the dance party. And... Uh, that's not great. I don't love the dance parties. And I don't think they're doing the dance parties anymore on the field pregame. And that's a good thing. I'm not a fan of the dance parties. But he seems like a nice kid. He doesn't get in any trouble. I just, uh, I don't know. Uh, there was some transfer smoke about Kenyatta Jackson over the offseason. And a lot of people were concerned about his attitude towards the program. But it sounds like he's starting off good this spring. Um, Ryan Day said that something about his attitude and uh, when he has a good attitude and he's locked in, how good he is. And I think that we're going to see quite a bit of him. Ryan Day talked about playing five, six deep on the defensive line because the season's so long. Um, and it sounds like uh, Jack Sawyer's starting off good. He talked about Jack Sawyer and how he helped recruit the class. And I just think Jack's going to blow up this year. We saw him in the Missouri game. He looked amazing. And he's been such a great leader such a great Buckeye, and one of these guys that came in with expectations that were just massive, and, you know, at first he didn't quite live up to those expectations um, and caught a lot of heat for it. And, 
you know, fair or unfair. I, I mean, I don't think it was fair, but at the same time, I was just as frustrated as everybody else because you just kind of thought, based on all the hype about him and based on his size, that he was going to come in and, and just be something really unique. And he hasn't looked really unique up until last season. And last season, I think he looked pretty doggone unique. Um, but he's always played his butt off. He's always worked his butt off. And this guy just came back for his senior year. I think it's awesome. Really rooting for Jack. And I think he just might be the guy that gets that number zero and will be a captain of the team. Uh, he's a great kid and a hometown Buckeye. And Day highlighted yesterday how he helped him re recruit the class. So that's an awesome thing. Um, the thing that warmed everybody's heart from that press conference was Ryan Day talking about calling coach Jim Tressel to get some advice on special teams. Now, he got rid of special teams coordinator Parker Fleming, and he was asked how he's going to delegate the special teams. And he said that it's not going to be one guy. It's going to be several guys. You know, each coach is going to take a little position group or a special teams group. And he said that he had called Coach Tressel, and Coach Tressel shared with him that when he was at Ohio State, he would assign one of the special teams to each of the coaches, and he got great buy-in from the players because the players really wanted to impress a position coach, particularly their position coach, much more than they did a special teams coach who is generally kind of low on the list of people you want to impress, which makes total sense. And I'm really happy that Ryan Day called Coach Tressel. Um, I feel like that, you know, that Coach Tressel would happily offer up any information to help, and I think that's great that uh, they're in communication. Uh, obviously, it, it tickles my heart when I hear that. I'm a huge fan of Coach Jim Tressel. I think he's just a wonderful man. Uh, Day said he's not worried about Michigan getting in, any uh, advanced intel from Tony Alford's departure. I'm sure Tony will share with them whatever he knows, but I don't think he knows much at all. Uh, you know, Chip's, Chip came in here and... It, what, they have two practices before Tony left? So I don't know what he could share. Uh, it's not like you don't got film from 11 prior games by the time Michigan plays Ohio State anyway. So there's nothing really that uh, they're going to garner off of that. Um, I don't. Uh, Coach Day is coaching the running backs right now, temporarily. Uh, he said he's really enjoying it, and he broke down the first play. It took him 20 minutes. So I don't think the running backs are enjoying it if that's how, if that's how he's going about it. Uh, Pro Day is Wednesday. Will Howard and Devin Brown are going to throw balls to Xavier Johnson, Cade Stover, Sam Wiggles, and Tommy Eichenberg, Steel Chambers, and Josh Proctor will be participating. If you don't remember, uh, Sam Wiggles is a transfer from Ohio State, a wide receiver out of Brexville, and he transferred down to Ohio University, went down and had a great junior year and a really good senior year. And I absolutely love this, that they have stayed in contact with Wiggles, and they are letting him come up to participate in the Ohio State Pro Day. I think that is a super classy move, and, I mean, they're to be applauded for that. Good for Sam Wiggles. I wish him the best of luck. He's a guy that was just buried on the depth chart, busted his butt. Everybody loved him, and he was just never going to play. So he got to go down to Ohio University, play a lot, put up some great numbers, show his skills, and now he gets to come practice in front of the Pro Scouts at Ohio State's Pro Day, and the fact that they invited him up there to do that is just awesome. And I just think that's very, I mean, I just respect the heck out of that. So after Jim Trussell came in and won the national championship in 2002, his second year with the team, it led to one of my favorite eras in Ohio State football. It was full of amazing personalities and some of my favorite players ever. Uh, some of the most memorable games in Ohio State history, a period with tons of big games. We're talking home and home with Texas back when early season out of conference games were very rare, huge Michigan games against very, very good Michigan teams, national championship games, Fiesta Bowls, even a very exciting Alamo Bowl to end the season the right way uh, and lead into a, another, another season the right way. Um, just a crazy exciting time in Ohio State football, like 2003 to 2007-ish. So I really wanted to take a trip down memory lane with someone who knew all that stuff intimately. And who better than a guy who started in 2004, 5, 6, 7, the guy who was a Buckeye captain, the first player in the history of the Ohio State-Michigan game to start four games and win all four. A coach's first team All-American, a guy who played in two national championships, played in the game of the century, 
a guy who wasn't afraid to speak his mind, and he's still not. That guy's Kirk Barton. Kirk was a nasty player on the field, an absolute winner. And Kirk came in to join me and talk about his memorable time at Ohio State and the memorable time in Ohio State football history that he was a massive part of. And we went for a long time. So I'm going to break it down into two parts. And we're going to join right now as Kirk Barton takes us back to 2005 in the crazy quarterback competition between Justin Zwick and Troy Smith. And Kirk was great. Enjoy, guys. And so they put me in front of the media, and the media asked me about the quarterback competition. And I said, well, you know, Justin Zwick and Troy Smith are both great players, and I think they should both play. That was my quote. I did not say that Troy should play. I said they should both play. And, you know, and again, I was like, you know, we rotate running backs. I think they're both great players. I think they both deserve to play. Um, and again, like, you know, usually when you do that and you get a big enough sample size, you know, one guy usually shakes loose and becomes the better player, which is what Troy eventually did. But at the time, like, neither neither of them and our offense was not exactly letting the world Like, our offense sucked the first six games. So, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. You know, we weren't playing. I wasn't playing yet. Anthony Gonzalez wasn't playing yet. You know, Ted Ginn was kind of a gadget player. Um, we weren't playing Antonio Pittman enough yet. So, like, in the middle of the season after we were 3-3 three and three and we, it was just very clear that we sucked on offense, the staff decided to make a lot of changes. Like, they put me in. They put Gonzo in. And then magically, like we got way better because we played the right, we played way better players than the guys that were playing in front of us. So, you know, I mean, I don't think it was fair to Justin that he had to play with, you know, lesser players. Um, and, you know, and, and again, like, I think that quarterbacks are very much, um, they're very much, uh, dependent on infrastructure. And that means offensive line, specifically tackles, being able to pass block your running game, uh, and, and having receivers that can win consistently because, you know, you put Gonzo in, all of a sudden he's going to cook who's ever playing nickelback when he's playing slot because Gonzo was very fast, very shifty, great oh, yeah. short shuttle guy. Um, and then, you know, Teddy, Teddy, you know, Teddy was only a true freshman that year. So he he got more confident. And obviously, you know, San Antonio was the superstar on that on the offense in 04. Um, but, you know, we started to come along. You know, we put TJ Downing in for the Michigan game. That was a big upgrade. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, the, the offense – as a whole was better but troy you know the thing about troy is he, he was a difference maker um just because of his playmaking uh with his arm but also his ability to create on the run uh and scramble because if you go back and watch this when when we were stinking like there were times where troy completely bailed us out uh scrambling you know because again this was before um quarterbacks were were i guess as loose as they are now like a lot of these quarterbacks now are, are superior athletes to guys 20 years ago it wasn't as much there's not as many statues in the nfl um, so Troy, you know, when, when he started running, it was a big problem. If you watch that 04 Michigan game, he absolutely broke their back in half by scrambling on, on plays that weren't designed as scrambles. And that was a big difference maker is Troy is, is obviously more athletic than Justin. Um, and there's times where, you know, things weren't, you know, they were off in man coverage and Troy took off and it, it literally saved us. Cause if in 04, Troy won that game, <clears throat> like put us on his shoulders and he was, uh, you know, it was like one of those those performances where, you know, we were underdogs at home, like 10-point dogs, and Troy Smith wasn't having it that day, and he balled out. Yeah, yeah. So you get to the end of the season in 2005, and it's a Fiesta Bowl matchup against Notre Dame, led by Brady Quinn. They were the mm -hmm. media darlings. Uh, yep. You know, they were really good. He was so popular at the time. Um, it was the game with, uh, with Laura Quinn and the split jersey that everybody remembers. And AJ played a fantastic game. Uh, my boy Antonio Pittman from Akron had a sweet run to put it away. <laughs> but uh, w what do you remember about that Fiesta Bowl game? And at the time, th the Fiesta Bowl was a massive game to be in. I um, yeah, obviously the buildup. Uh, I mean, Charlie Weiss got like a huge extension after like seven or eight games at Notre Dame. He got like a, a seven or eight year deal and. I mean, he, he was the mastermind of, of, of exploiting like some short-term success where he's like, well, you know, in recruiting every NFL team, you know, everyone's going to use it against me that I'm going to go to the NFL. So I need to get an eight year monsters contract. And he fooled all the regions and the, you know, the, the, the donors at Notre Dame into, into paying how much God bless him. He got paid. Um, but you know, Brady, Brady's the guy that should have went to Ohio state. I really like Brady Quinn every, you know, I, I mean, I, I was with him at Michigan's football camp. I knew him at Ohio State's camp. I, I was with him in the Denver Broncos. Like Brady's a great dude. Like he's a guy that I wish would have been a Buckeye. 
Um, and that's not a slight on Todd Beckman. I love Todd too, but Brady, Brady was really good and I, and I liked him. So, you know, I was, you know, I was, I wasn't nervous cause our defense was so rock solid, but I knew those guys could score and I knew they're going to have a good scheme. You know, that's Samarja. Uh, they had uh Darius Walker, a good running back. They had, their own line had like three or four NFL guys. Ryan Harris was a second round pick left tackle. I mean, that's like really good dudes. So, um, and then on defense, they had guys who like Vic, Victor Abbey and Amari, who I blocked every single snap of the game was a second round pick. Uh, Trevor Laws was like a third round pick. I mean, they had NFL guys everywhere. Uh, Zivikowski was on that team. So we knew it was going to be a tough matchup, but we also knew that we were, you know, we hadn't played a complete game yet all year. You know, again, even that Michigan game at the end of that year, it was ugly. I and mean, we were down a lot of points with like seven minutes to go. And we had one of the greatest comebacks in school history. But, you know, we knew that there was, um, Notre Dame was going to be a, a challenge. They were going to be well coached. Uh, Charlie Weiss is going to be um, have have us schemed up, and you know he's looking for his you know that feather in his cap win because you know that was the year that they had the the Bush push game where they they easily could have beaten right. USC. Um, so like USC was regarded going into our game, USC was regarded as maybe the best team of all time. And if Vince Young doesn't scramble in, that probably is regarded as the greatest USC team or the greatest college football team of all time. If they yeah. go undefeated with two Heisman winners on the roster and blah, blah, blah. But like with, with, um, with Notre Dame, it was just like, you know, we had to, we had to be on point and we, uh, you know, we, we were, uh, we were, we were locked in. Our, our practices were very physical. It was very tough. Um, you know, and, and like we kind of had a point to prove because, you know, we, we felt like we should be in the national championship game. That was a team that I would have killed to, if we would have had a 14 playoff, um, or an 18 playoff or a tw- I mean, that's the team that could have won a national championship. Cause we were, we were getting hot right at the end of the season. Um, and unfortunately with the, with the old format, like that didn't, uh, that didn't do us any good, but yeah, that was a, that was a fun win. That was probably outside of the Michigan wins. All the Michigan wins are at the top, obviously, cause of what's at stake, but that was easily the, the funnest, uh, non Michigan game of my life because of what was at stake. And it's nice to send the seniors off with a nice bowl win because, that group, like like I say, it's the, the the totalitarity of the fact that that group of guys will never play football together ever again after that game. So it's like you want to send those seniors out the right way. And San Antonio Holmes went pro after that, and you know we kind of knew who was leaving. So, but you want to send guys like AJ Hawk and Nick Mangold and Rob Sims out the right way. Yeah, an incredible group of guys, um, mm-hmm. and, and you guys did send them out great. And then the next year, it's the rematch against Texas. You're heading mm-hmm. back down to Austin. You got revenge on your mind. What is the energy like heading into that game? It was massive. Vince Young was gone. Colt McCoy was taken over, and he was a very highly regarded, you know, young kid. But um, it, he wasn't Vince. But uh, it looked like you guys could go in and get some revenge. I mean, I was jacked. Everybody was. Tell us about that game. Well, I I remember after we lost to Texas, I wanted Texas to win the national championship. I mean, obviously, you know, I was hoping they'd lose a game so we could maybe get back in the hunt. But after we lost our second game to Penn State, like we were out of it. So I really wanted. Vince to win the national championship and leave because I knew that if we went down there in 06 and Vince was back, that would have been really, really tough. But you know, with Colt McCoy as a redshirt freshman, I felt like obviously we had a better chance because our defense was going to have to do some replenishing. I know that they, people always like to say that we don't, you know, we, we always reload, but mm-hmm. that's, that's just, those are just words. Like when you lose AJ Hawk and Schlegel and Bobby Carpenter and Dante Whitner and I mean, you can't just reload from that. I and mean, those guys are first round picks, leaders, wicked smart players, really athletic, talented, physical players. So like, you know, we had a lot of young guys that were playing really their first real minutes at Ohio State. And you know, we played uh, uh who did we open? We opened up with Northern Illinois, a uh, Mac team that we were we were beating them like twenty eight to nothing literally in the first quarter. So that was like a blowout. And then, you know, we knew we had Texas coming the next week and and I'm telling you, that was uh, that was um, that was one of those ones because like you know they had Jamal Charles and Jermichael yeah. Finley, and they had I mean they had some guys that were you know if you give those guys space on defense like Jamal Charles is four he's a four three guy so he's going to the crib. They had Henry Melton, the big they had the big running back. They had a really good O line. Justin Blaylock was on that team as an All American. Lima Swede was back, so we knew um, we had to go. Their defense had most of the same guys back. Um, so we felt confident because we we, you know, we whipped them pretty good the year before. Uh, so you know, but we had new guys. We had Alex Boone, Steve Raring. Uh, those guys were new. Doug Dash was playing center that year. He played left tackle the year before. So you know, we we knew we had to be ready to go. And that was where Trust famously said that the third drive of the game we were putting in the backup offensive line because he was so 
paranoid about the heat because it was, you know, I mean, like a week before the game, it was like 108 degrees or something crazy in Texas. And then the night of the game, it, it ended up being like not terrible. It was in the 90s, but it wasn't like 108. And so, but Tress was like, he was spooked about it. He was scared to death. And uh, so they're like, we're going to put in the backup O line and whatever happens, happens. So, you know, a lot of guys that are, um, uh, they're, they're just normally standing on the game. They actually had to go play against like the big dogs. They didn't get to play against the backups. Like at the end of the game, when you're up by 60 points. So, uh, and we went down and scored, which was amazing because we called a bunch of plays where basically the offensive line didn't have to block anybody he plays like nakeds and play action fakes and stuff. And we went right down the field and scored. So I'll be, I'll be darned. Cause I remember yeah. like Donald Washington, had a turnover and was mm -hmm. running down the field and I jumped up and I was like, we got to go score because we had a short field and they literally stuck. They literally stuck with that third, that second team on line. And I was like, are you guys insane? Like we're playing the number one team in the country at home and no one's ever done this before, but it worked. So I give Jim Trussell and Jim Bowman a lot of credit for that because um, those guys like, you know, Tyler Whaley and Kyle Mitchum and John Skinner, uh, Tim Schaefer, those guys all went out there and scored a touchdown. So I was like, this is amazing. But you know, winning that game, it was amazing. Obviously at the time it was a one, two game. I was playing with plantar fasciitis, which was absolutely excruciatingly painful. Um, I took a nice big injection of Tordal before the game into my foot, <laughs> uh, which was awesome until you know, it only lasts for like an hour. So the second half of the game, my foot, it was like stepping on a nail every time I did everything, but um, it was fun because we revenged that we, we, we avenged that game. We didn't have him on the foreseeable schedule. Obviously, we played him um, in 08 when I was I was gone from the program as in the NFL. Um, but it was a uh, it was a fun win. The, the only thing that sucked is that Texas really wasn't that good that year. I think they they might have been like I think maybe eight and four nine. They had like three or four losses that year, so they weren't the Texas team of the year before. But um, yeah, it was still good to to avenge that loss down in Austin. Yeah, yeah, and Troy and Gonzo were great that night. Um, you did something that night that made headlines all over the country in every newspaper. Uh, it was the first time I had ever heard uh, heard of Horns Down, um, and uh, you were always a showman. Was that planned? Oh, I, I couldn't wait to do it. I couldn't. <laughs> I, couldn't I couldn't wait to do it. I mean, I could because I because I hated their players. I, I thought they were soft. I thought that we gave them the game the year before. Yeah, there, there's nothing worse. Like it's one thing if you get beat. But it's another thing when you just give the game away. Like again, like when we lost to the Florida Gators and they smashed us, like that we got beat that night. And, and again, we made a thousand mistakes. Our best player broke, you know, got his leg broken by Roy Hall. But like the LSU game the next year, we gave that game away. Like we had five personal fouls. We had a, we, you know, we roughed the punter on fourth and twenty. That one's like, coming up, Kirk. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm saying like you can't when you play teams with equal talent, you can't you can't kick five field goals like we did in 05 versus Texas, and you can't you know, be terrible in the red zone. You, you gotta, you gotta be proficient. You gotta be good. And we weren't. So, you know, with the, when their, their players celebrated and their, their one defensive end was such a douchebag. And I was like, I can't wait to see this guy again the next year. And as soon as we won that game and I knew that we weren't playing him again next year, I was like, Oh, I can't wait to give the horns down. Cause I was like, this is going to be amazing because I, I just, I hated Texas. I hated everything about Texas. Um, and it's funny. Cause like, I don't mind Texas now cause Quinn years there. That's my dude. But I, I, I just, you know, at the time, man, I was like, our fans were excited. I, you know, one of the most gratifying things when you're a player is the fact that, you know, when you know people are spending extreme amounts of money to come watch you, like that game was extremely expensive. The hotels were expensive. The airfare was expensive and you win and you know, that's going to be like a memorable, mem you know, it's going to be a good memory for the fan base. Like that's great. Cause people still talk to me about how much fun they had in Austin, uh, I think Austin's a great city. I think Austin should actually host a bowl game. Because I think, you know, Austin should ho host like a, a college football playoff game because there's a lot of stuff to do. It's eclectic. It's it's fun. People love Sixth Street. And I've heard about that for years. So, um, but no, I absolutely want to do that because I hated them. And they kind of ruined our 05 year. So to get vengeance felt very sweet. Um, and also I was in excruciating pain. So to be able to like hang in there and play, uh, in a lot of pain and still be productive and, and play well. Uh, it meant a lot to me. And so I was really excited to give the horns down. I absolutely loved it. I thought it was a, just an epic stunt. But uh, so you kind of steamroll everybody else for the rest of the year. Troy was unbelievable. Um, you, you maybe had one kind of rougher game in the middle of the season. 
But after that, it was like the whole country was just waiting for the inevitable Ohio State Michigan showdown, both coming in undefeated because you both kind of had cream puffs throughout the second half of the season. And the build up to that game, it just took forever, but it was it was really long and, and it was just like, man, let's let's get this thing here. But leading up to the game, Bo dies. I mean, the, the game was just so huge. Um, I, obviously, take it away. I want to hear about the game of the century from Kirk Barton's end. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we got past, I don't know if it was Penn State, I think it was Penn State, um, you know, and, and once we beat them, it was like kind of Green Puff City. It was Indiana and Purdue and not Purdue, not Purdue, uh, Bowling Green. It was just like Illinois. And Illinois actually was a game where we sucked. I mean, we, it was like, a, I think we won like 17 to 10. We were one in the country. They were like two and 10 or two and eight or something. And like, we just, we went up there and just, we were just horrifically bad against Illinois. Uh, and then the next week we played Northwestern and beat the tar out of them. But you know, that Michigan game, obviously we knew Michigan was good. Uh, Michigan was not great in Oh five. I think they were maybe eight and four. They, they, you know, they went to, they ended up going to the Alamo bowl in Oh five and they played Nebraska and they lost. And, but we knew that they had good players. I mean, they had Lamar Woodley, they had Allen Branch, they had Jake Long, Henny. You know, those are all NFL guys, and and mm -hmm. not like seventh rounders. I'm talking about guys like Jake went first in the draft. Lamar Woodley was a second round pick. I mean, they had like legitimate cats that were really good. David Harris was the captain of the Jets for like ten years. Uh, so we knew that we'd see those guys and that they'd be much better. And they made some changes up there. Uh, they started running kind of the Denver Bronco like zone blocking scheme and. They were shredding teams, and I remember they went to they they went to they went to South Bend, and Notre Dame was like a preseason one or two team. They had everybody back from that 05 team, where we lost a lot from the 05 team. We lost a lot of our defense, but Notre Dame had everybody back there. I think they were number two in the country, and Michigan went out there and massacred them. And Woodley was balling, Branch was balling, uh, the, the offense was really good. And that's where, like, I think everybody kind of took note that this is like this Michigan team's for real this year. This isn't like the 05 team. Uh, they had Manningham, who was ex an excellent receiver. Oh, yeah. Uh, deep threat. Ohio kid, wasn't and, he? Yeah, yeah he's, yeah. he's from Warren Harding. He, I mean, he was, yeah. he was one of the best players I've ever seen in high school. And he was just as good in college and had a nice NFL career. But, you know, so we knew those guys were real and we knew we were going to see him and we knew it was at home. And so there was, you know, the buildup started like a month before the game because we were both playing like cream puffs coming down the stretch. There wasn't like a, a big game that we were worried about. So we get to that game and, you know, the buildup is crazy. And then, you know, obviously Bo passes away, I think on Thursday, they announce it on Friday. So all day Friday, all everyone's talking about is Bo. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm like, like, God bless Bo. Obviously Woody Hayes' is best friend, you know, great friend, but like, I don't care about Bo Schebeckler. Like I, I care about blocking Lamar Woodley. Like I don't, I mean, Bo, 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 Bo's not going to be out there pass rushing against me. So, you know, so that was this kind of my mentality. You know, it's not, I'm not you know, disrespecting the dead, but I just, I didn't care. And, and I said some very vicious stuff about that. Cause it's like, you know, if you guys want to be distracted by any stupid thing that flies past the screen or is on the scroll on ESPN, then you can do that, but we still got to do our jobs, you know, and we still got to, you know, don't don't act like the Holy Spirit's out there. You know, bull rushing us. Like we got to go block the same guys that we blocked last year, and a lot of the same guys that were there in 04. Um, and we got to go get this win, and it's going to be, and, and we're going to have to score a lot of points because Michigan's offense was excellent, and their running game was excellent, and I was right about that because our defense we gave did. up 39. Yep, uh, and we scored 42. So again, it's like you just got to win the game by one point. Like against Michigan, I always tell people, I'm like, look, people get all people get all depressed and they have to take Xanax when they look at the box scores, when we beat a team by 65 points instead of 75 points. And they don't, you know, they're like, Oh my God, we didn't have 750 yards of offense this week. Uh, you just got to beat Michigan by one point. That's yeah. it. There's not, there's nothing else that matters. And no, I don't care about the box score touchdown, you know, sacks. I don't care if we went three to two, two to nothing. So, all right. So you win the 2006 game and mm -hmm. Urban Meyer is lobbying for his Florida team to make it to the championship game. Um, and I'm hoping that that happens because I don't want to see Michigan again. How are you feeling about that? You know, it was, it was interesting because obviously, you know, the SEC didn't exist back then. Like the SEC was completely irrelevant 
uh, leading up to that 06 championship game. You know, you got to remember, and uh, it, this isn't me being Big Ten <clears throat> nostalgic guy, but like in 04, the Auburn Tigers went undefeated in, in the SEC, which again, nobody cared about the SEC. And they got left out of the national championship game. And that was the year that USC played Oklahoma and beat them like six, like 55 to like 10. It was a, it was just a bludgeoning. And so that's how little people thought of the SEC back then. So, you know, the SEC obviously, um, you know, wasn't a conference that was as highly regarded as the big 10 and the big 12 and the pac 10 and, and whatever. So, uh, you know, and again, that might be just my thoughts and maybe nationally it was different, but they weren't the juggernaut that they became after the 06 game. So I thought, and I knew urban for a long time. Urban was the first guy off from his scholarship. I was excited to play against him. Um, I saw what he was doing at Florida. I loved his offense. Uh, but yeah, I got a really good show of his offense that night. It was, uh, it was amazing to watch. I mean, seriously, guys, if I could pepper him with questions for five hours, I would. And I think he would just keep going. Um, his stories are great. He remembers everything. Uh, and be sure to join us for part two, <laughs> where we start off talking about in and out Burger, um, the 50-day break between the, uh, the game of the century and the Florida game, um, the Florida and LSU game. And then we move into today, talk about the playoffs, the state of the program currently, transfers and NIL. You're not going to want to miss it. It was awesome. Um, and that'll do it for today. So thank you so much for joining me. At Juck on Bucks, please subscribe to the video uh, and hit your alarm bell so you can see part two of that interview with Kirk. And if you're on the move, you can catch the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And a very special thank you to Kirk Barton for joining our new little show. Obviously, he has nothing to gain from coming on here uh, other than doing something nice for a friend. So thank you very much, Kirk. I appreciate you, buddy. And thank you, guys. Juck on Bucks out. <laughs>